Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Today we will look at a new topic, that of coloring graphs. It's kind of a surprising topic, but it's a classical one and it has many applications and some surprising results indeed. But before we go on and look at the various ways of coloring graphs that we will study, let's go back a few steps. So remember when we defined bipartite graphs, we said that a bipartite graph equivalently can be defined as a graph where you can color the vertices in two different colors so that all the edges go between vertices of different colors. And you have also seen uh, k-partite graphs for k greater than 2 where the same principle with more colors and that's somehow the direction we want to go in. So we want to generalize this concept of coloring the vertices. And the questions that we want to ask, the first question is, given a graph that we don't know from the beginning uh, if it is bipartite or we don't know anything about it, we want to determine how many colors we need to color this graph so that the edges will always go between vertices of different color. If we can answer this question, that this tells us something about the structure of the graph and how complex the graph is. If we know that we can color a certain graph with a certain number of colors, we can flip the question and ask, in how many ways can we do this? In how many ways can we color this given graph with this set of colors? And so far by coloring graph, I mean we color the vertices, but you can also ask similar questions about edge colorings. And if you have a plane graph, you can ask the same question about coloring the faces of a plane graph. So these are all the questions that we are going to look at. So uh, all throughout, we will look at a graph with no loops. So why do we look at a graph with no loops? Well, we want to color vertices so that edges go between vertices of different color. If we have loops, well, there is nothing we can do because a loop goes from a vertex to itself. So we are already in big trouble. So all the graphs for this to be meaningful will be without loops. Then we can have a chance to have edges between vertices of different colors. And that's precisely what we want. So we call a graph K colorable if its vertices can be colored using k colors so that no adjacent vertices have the same color. So for example, this graph is one colorable, obviously, but it's also 17 colorable. There is no requirement that I actually use all my colors. If I do use all my k colors, I call the graph k chromatic. So a k-chromatic graph is a k-colorable graph that is not k-1 colorable. In other words, it's k-colorable and k is the smallest number for which it is k-colorable. Uh, and the number k, the smallest possible number of colors, is called the chromatic uh, number and denoted by the Greek letter chi or chi. Uh, it all comes from the Greek word chroma meaning color. So let's look at a few examples. So what do you think that the chromatic number, so the least number of colors to color the cycle graph is? Pause and think. Well, if we have our cycle graph, it's going to look something like this. And the edges go between uh, like that. So we will definitely not uh, be satisfied with just one color. We're going to need to color every other vertex a different color. And then it really depends. So when I have gone through all vertices and come back here, am I on a red color or am I on a black color? This depends if the number of vertices is even or odd. If the number is even, I can color every other vertex red, every other vertex black, and be fine with that. In other words, I will only need two colors. But if the number of vertices is odd, then this last vertex will have to have some other color. And therefore, we get the result that we get 
the chromatic number 2 for even and, and 3 for odd. How about the wheel graph? Pause and think. Well, the wheel graph is the same story as the cycle graph. We have this cycle and we have this vertex in the middle that is adjacent to everything. So, of course, in this case, I'm excluding the trivial uh, cases with just one vertex. I'm, I'm talking about, say, large n, uh, or n at least three something. Uh, so, again here, for the outer cycle, I'm going to need the same reasoning as for Cn. So I'm going to need two colors if I have an even number of outer vertices, and three colors if I have an odd number of outer vertices. But also I need an extra color for the central vertex because it's adjacent to everything. So it cannot be the same color as any other vertex. It has to have a different color. So the answer is it's three for odd n and four for even n. The switch between odd and even is because uh, the number n here measures the total number of vertices. So odd wheel graph uh, W17 has 16 uh, uh, vertices on the outer cycle and one central vertex. How about the complete graph? Pause and think. The answer is uh, the complete graph needs a whole bunch of colors. Let's look at the four complete graph. Because all vertices are adjacent to all other vertices, no two vertices can be of the same color, because if they were, then the adjacency between them would not work. So that is why we need n colors to color the complete graph. This in particular means that, contrary to what the two first examples might suggest, the chromatic number is not necessarily low. Whichever number you give me, I can produce a graph that has that number as chromatic number, and that will need that number of colors to color its vertices. Namely, I will just give you the complete graph on this number of vertices. A graph being one colorable means that you can color all vertices in one color, so no edges are between vertices of this same one color. This simply means there are no edges, so the graph is a null graph. And as we said, uh, two colorability is the same as being bipartite. Note that here, smaller than or equal to, and not necessarily equal to, because a bipartite graph might not require both colors to color all vertices. A null graph, for example, is bipartite in a trivial way. And saying that the chromatic graph, uh, chromatic number is at most k uh, is the same as saying that g is k colorable. And you have seen this terminology before under the name k partite, but that was just another name for the same thing. So now that we have seen the definition and some examples, let's ask the first question we wanted to answer. So how many colors do we actually need for a given graph to be able to color the vertices so that no edges go between vertices of the same color? So to answer this, we might just as well look at simple graphs altogether. Why is that? It's because we really only care about whether two vertices are adjacent or not. Uh, if two vertices are adjacent with one edge or with 17 edges, doesn't matter for the fact that we cannot color them in the same color. So we don't lose anything by assuming the graph is simple. Our first result will relate the number of colors to the degrees of the vertices. So if you have a simple graph, says the theorem, and each vertex has degree no bigger than delta for some number delta, seven or whatever, fixed delta, then g is delta plus one colorable. So you need one color more than the degree of the highest degree vertex. So how do you prove such a thing? We prove it by induction on the number of vertices. If you just have one vertex, then since the graph is simple, the degree is zero. And uh, we want to show that such a graph is zero plus one colorable, so one colorable, 
and obviously the null graph on one vertex is one colorable, so we're done. For the induction step, assume that you have n vertices greater than one and that the highest degree is delta. We need to show that it's enough to use delta plus one colors. So remove a vertex. Now when you remove the vertex V, the remaining graph has n minus one vertices and certainly the highest degree uh, is at most delta. The highest degree can go down if you remove a vertex, but of course not go up. So this new graph that you have created has one vertex less. Since we're proving by induction, the induction hypothesis tells us that this graph is delta plus one colorable. So what's the situation now? We have been able to color by the induction hypothesis all the vertices of our graph with this vertex removed in delta plus one color. Now we need to show that when we put this vertex back, we don't need extra colors. Well, this vertex, remember, had degree uh, no greater than delta. So it will be adjacent to delta vertices at most. And we have delta plus one colors available. So there will always be at least one color that's not used up by the vertices around this vertex V. And we can use that color for V. And this proves that our graph is delta plus one color. This can slightly be improved. There is a theorem by Brooks from 1941 that says that if your graph uh, is simple, connected and not complete, and the degree is smaller than or equal to delta, well, here you have to assume that delta is at least three, but it's not a big deal. Uh, then G is delta colorable. I'm glossing over this theorem because the proof is hard and we're not going to go through it, but just to show that you can improve slightly. You can actually use one less color than we just proved. Either way, you can ask, are these theorems optimal? And it turns out it's not. So these theorems are useful if you don't have a vertex that has a much bigger degree than all other vertices. For example, Brooks' theorem tells us that the wheel graph with, say, uh, 17 vertices is 16 colorable. But we already know that it's 4 colorable, so we know that we actually don't need all the 16 colors. So this, these theorems are useful for some graphs, but not for all. But still, they are our first important results.